Police answer that the Serb border guards are celebrating, firing their guns in the air occasionally. Well, I guess we can hear him. A short distance away, the local Albanian army commander decides to begin the peace by cleaning up remnants of the war. Despite warnings that it was not advisable, he orders his men to remove an unexploded NATO bomb with pickaxes. The Yugoslav-Albanian frontier was a no-man's land during the war and remains a no-man's land during the peace, a place caught in the transition between war and peace, where people aren't sure how to act or what to do. So while the soldiers keep digging away at the bomb, a farmer decides to cut the growth of an untended field. Despite the sounds of artillery exploding just across the border, the curious come for a chance to see what peace looks like. Instead, they get an earful of the last gasps of a war. As does a jeep from the cautious United Nations High Commission for Refugees. They show the flag at the marina crossing, then retreat. It's still dangerous up here, but the UN knows it will be back. Hundreds of thousands of refugees will soon be passing through here when it's safe enough to do so. But for the present, the whistle of birds still must occasionally compete with the whiz-bang of bombs. Mike Betcher, CNN, on the Yugoslavian-Albanian frontier. Control, uh, adjust, making adjustments, and making the final preparations as the forces plan to go in. They'll be watching the withdrawal of those Serb troops that by uh, the 15th of June have to be withdraw from Zone 1. That is the zone... Uh, uh, which is in the southernmost part of uh, Kosovo. Then in, uh, by the 18th of June, they have to withdraw from the second zone, and then from the 20th, they have to be completely out of zone three so that the withdrawal is totally completed by the 20th. Meanwhile, on the border with, uh, uh, with Kosovo in Macedonia, at Camp Abel Sentry, U.S. Marines have arrived, the first that landed from uh, ships that land were off the coast of Greece. They will be joined by uh, uh, about 2,000 Army troops. Some of those flew in today with Apache attack helicopters, the helicopters that were never used in the war against Kosovo, but will now stand ready to protect the peacekeepers. And the commander of those forces in Macedonia stands ready to lead his troops into peace. All in all, uh, this amounts to very closely coordinated an extraordinary sequence of events which, at long last, have led to Belgrade meeting NATO's five demands to end this conflict. General Jackson was tight-lipped when asked when his first troops would start to move in, but uh, NATO and Pentagon sources indicate that that could happen as soon as Saturday. Tony? Jerry <laughs> Little Melita has spent all but three days of her young life in the forest. Thousands of Kosovo refugees didn't make it to Albania or Macedonia. Instead, they took to the hills. There's little food and no medicines. People are surviving, but the children especially show increasing signs of malnutrition. Uh, her medical condition is very difficult at the moment because there is a lake of medicals, there is a lake of... Uh, nutrition for his mother because there's no food, no medicals, no nothing. This baby is one of several born here in the woods. She's called Vittoria, Victory in Albanian. Her mother says that fleeing on foot while heavily pregnant and giving birth in the forest was sheer hell. It's mainly women and children in the camp. The menfolk are missing or away fighting with the KLA. We saw hundreds of families, and this is just one place, the first we came to. The situation of these people is all the more poignant because they are still here, inside Kosovo. Their towns and villages are just a few hours walk away. Some are living in a forest, almost in sight of their homes. The burned houses in nearby villages are evidence, the refugees say, of the Serbian campaign to drive people away. Serbian paramilitaries did this, they say. It wasn't battle damage and it wasn't NATO. All the villages and what we could see of the nearby town were like this. When NATO does finally get here, they'll find a land both deserted and devastated. 
Paul Wood, BBC News, Kosovo. Marita Aloni went with her father to check his car. It's a good car. It works. Yes, it's work. And it's going to take you home? Yeah, yeah. When? Cool. Maybe 10 days. 12. No. <laughs> I like no. When they get home, they'll be hurt again. When they see what the war has done. But they won't be refugees anymore. And that's worth a lot. Jeremy Bo Celebration on the main bridge here, which NATO, in the end, never quite bombed. When the rejoicing's over, people may start to reflect who got them into all this in the first place. But for now, they're just glad it's over. John Simpson, BBC News, Belgrade. The trouble is that Holy Land is now littered with thousands of landmines. So on the very eve of their advance into Kosovo, the British have been on last-minute training to prepare for the hazards ahead. Not only mines, but also booby traps, unexploded shells and bombs, and of course the possibility that some Serbs may decide to stay behind and fight. Obviously you get the odd uh, minor fractions who uh, are determined to stay on and fight. But uh, personally, I think that the majority of the Serb forces will have had enough of the bombardment they've been receiving for the past so many weeks and uh, just crack on. Hopefully, Milosevic has still got a good enough and firm enough grip that they'll listen to him and they'll all be pulled out. So we don't really anticipate any troubles, but obviously we've done the training. Today, NATO commanders arrived at the Kosovo border for more talks with their counterparts from the Yugoslav army. This time, they were discussing details of the road from here to the Kosovo capital, Pristina, trying to get more information about booby traps and mines along it. Meanwhile, the Americans are massing here too. Swarms of their helicopters fill the skies over Macedonia. Black Hawks and the much-feared Apaches, which have flown in from Albania. It looks like an invasion force, but the generals in charge are praying their men will not have to fire a shot. So far, NATO's air campaign in the Balkans has been casualty-free. Ironically, keeping the peace in Kosovo may be far more dangerous than making war. Ben Brown, BBC News, Bloodsay on the Kosovo-Macedonia border. At least the beginning of the end of a dark and desolate chapter in the history of the Balkans. Today we embark on the path of peace. This path will be marked by difficulties and dangers that will require no less courage and determination than the events that brought us to this point. Well, we're Police are withdrawing from Kosovo. The one million men, women, and children driven from their land are preparing to return home. The demands of an outraged and united international community have been met. I can report to the American people that we have achieved a victory for a safer world, for our democratic values, and for a stronger America. Our pilots have returned to base. The airstrikes have been suspended. Aggression against an innocent people has been contained and is being turned back. When I ordered our armed forces into combat, we had three clear goals. To enable the Kosovar people, the victims of some of the most vicious atrocities in Europe since the Second World War, to return to their homes with safety and self-government. To require Serbian forces responsible for those atrocities to leave Kosovo. And to deploy an international security force with NATO at its core to protect all the people of that troubled land Serbs and Albanians alike. Those goals will be achieved. A necessary conflict has been brought to a just and honorable conclusion. The result will be security and dignity for the people of Kosovo, achieved by an alliance that stood together in purpose and resolve, assisted by the diplomatic efforts of Russia. This victory brings a new hope that when a people are singled out for destruction because of their heritage and religious faith, and we can do something about it, the world will not look the other way. I want to express my profound gratitude to the men and women of our armed forces and those of our allies. Day after day, night after night, they flew, risking their lives to attack their targets and to avoid civilian casualties when they were fired upon from populated areas. I ask every American to join me in saying to them, thank you.
you've made us very proud. I'm also grateful to the American people for standing against the awful ethnic cleansing, for sending generous assistance to the refugees, and for opening your hearts and your homes to the innocent victims who came here. I want to speak with you for a few moments tonight about why we fought, what we achieved, and what we have to do now to advance the peace and together with the people of the Balkans, forge a future of freedom, progress, and harmony. We should remember that the violence we responded to in Kosovo was the culmination of a 10-year campaign by Slobodan Milosevic, the leader of Serbia, to exploit ethnic and religious differences in order to impose his will on the lands of the former Yugoslavia. That's what he tried to do in Croatia and in Bosnia and now in Kosovo. The world saw the terrifying consequences. 500 villages burned. Men of all ages separated from their loved ones to be shot and buried in mass graves. Women raped, children made to watch their parents die. A whole people forced to abandon in hours communities their families had spent generations building. For these atrocities, Mr. Milosevic and his top aides have been indicted by the International War Crimes Tribunal for war crimes and crimes against humanity. I'll never forget the Kosovar refugees I recently met. Some of them could barely talk about what they had been through. All they had left was hope that the world would not turn its back. When our diplomatic efforts to avert this horror were rebuffed and the violence mounted, we and our allies chose to act. Mr. Milosevic continued to do terrible things to the people of Kosovo, but we were determined to turn him back. Our firmness finally has brought an end to a vicious campaign of ethnic cleansing, and we acted early enough to reverse it, to enable the Kosovars to go home. When they do, they will be safe. They will be able to reopen their schools, speak their language, practice their religion, choose their leaders, and shape their destiny. There'll be no more days of foraging for food in the cold of mountains and forests. No more nights of hiding in cellars, wondering if the next day will bring death or deliverance. They will know that Mr. Milosevic's army and paramilitary forces will be gone. His 10-year campaign of repression finished. NATO has achieved this success as a united alliance, ably led by Secretary General Solana and General Clark. 19 democracies came together and stayed together through the stiffest military challenge in NATO's 50-year history. We also preserved our critically important partnership with Russia, thanks to President Yeltsin, who opposed our military effort, but supported diplomacy to end the conflict on terms that met our conditions. I'm grateful to Russian envoy Chernomyrdin and Finnish President Adesari for their work, and to Vice President Gore for the key role he played in putting their partnership together. Now I hope Russian troops will join us in the force that will keep the peace in Kosovo, just as they have in Bosnia. Finally, we have averted the wider war this conflict might well have sparked. The countries of Southeastern Europe backed the NATO campaign, helped the refugees, and showed the world there is more compassion than cruelty in this troubled region. This victory makes it all the more likely that they will choose a future of democracy, fair treatment of minorities, and peace. Now we're entering a new phase, building that peace, and there are formidable challenges. First, we must be sure the Serbian authorities meet their commitments. We are prepared to resume our military campaign should they fail to do so. Next, we must get the Kosovar refugees home safely. Minefields will have to be cleared. Homes destroyed by Serb forces will have to be rebuilt. Homeless people in need of food and medicine will have to get them. The fate of the missing will have to be determined. The Kosovo Liberation Army will have to demilitarize as it has agreed to do. And we in the peacekeeping force will have to ensure that Kosovo is a safe place to live for all its citizens, ethnic Serbs as well as ethnic Albanians. For these things to happen, security must be established. To that end, some 50,000 troops from almost 30 countries will deploy to Kosovo. Our European allies will provide the vast majority of them. America will contribute about 7,000. We are grateful that during NATO's air campaign, we did not lose a single serviceman in combat. 
but this next phase also will be dangerous. Bitter memories will still be fresh, and there may well be casualties. So we have made sure that the force going into Kosovo will have NATO command and control and rules of engagement set by NATO. It will have the means and the mandate to protect itself while doing its job. In the meantime, the United Nations will organize a civilian administration while preparing the Kosovars to govern and police themselves. As local institutions take hold, NATO will be able to turn over increasing responsibility to them and draw down its forces. A third challenge will be to put in place a plan for lasting peace and stability in Kosovo and through all the Balkans. For that to happen, the European Union and the United States must plan for tomorrow, not just today. We must help to give the democracies of Southeastern Europe a path to a prosperous, shared future, a unifying magnet more powerful than the pull of hatred and destruction that has threatened to tear them apart. Our European partners must provide most of the resources for this effort, but it is in America's interest to do our part as well. A final challenge will be to encourage Serbia to join its neighbors in this historic journey to a peaceful, democratic, united Europe. I want to say a few words to the Serbian people tonight. I know that you too have suffered in Mr. Milosevic's wars. You should know that your leaders could have kept Kosovo as a part of your country without driving a single Kosovar family from its home, without killing a single adult or child, without inviting a single NATO bomb to fall on your country. You endured 79 days of bombing, not to keep Kosovo a province of Serbia, but simply because Mr. Milosevic was determined to eliminate Kosovo Albanians from Kosovo dead or alive. As long as he remains in power, as long as your nation is ruled by an indicted war criminal, we will provide no support for the reconstruction of Serbia. But we are ready to provide humanitarian aid now and to help to build a better future for Serbia too when its government represents tolerance and freedom, not repression and terror. My fellow Americans, all these challenges are substantial, but they are far preferable to the challenges of war and continued instability in Europe. We have sent a message of determination and hope to all the world. Think of all the millions of innocent people who died in this bloody century because democracies reacted too late to evil and aggression. Because of our resolve, the 20th century is ending not with helpless indignation, but with a hopeful affirmation of human dignity and human rights for the 21st century. In a world too divided by fear among people of different racial, ethnic, and religious groups, we have given confidence to the friends of freedom and pause to those who would exploit human difference for inhuman purposes. America still faces great challenges in this world, but we look forward to meeting them. So tonight, I ask you to be proud of your country and very proud of the men and women who serve it in uniform. For in Kosovo, we did the right thing. We did it the right way. And we will finish the job. Good night, and may God bless our wonderful United States of America. As the last stages of the complicated timetable to end the war into just a few hours, and for once the Serbs were cooperative. They streamed across the border in such numbers that NATO swiftly concluded that they were keeping their word. Three hours after they'd begun, NATO's Secretary General made his decision. I can announce that uh, today that Milosevic has complied with the five conditions that the international community had placed, and therefore a few moments ago, I instructed General, General Clark to suspend NATO's air operations against Yugoslavia. Immediately, the information was passed to New York, where the UN Security Council went into session. They approved, by 14 to none, a resolution authorizing NATO's ground campaign and ordering the Serbs to withdraw. Those against? Abstentions? 
China swallowed its objections and abstained instead of vetoing. NATO now had rock-solid legal backing for its moral position. President Chirac in Toulon inspected more French troops on their way to join the build-up. By this evening, NATO had approved orders for the ground force to advance. In this curious conflict, the armies are advancing only after the enemy has surrendered. But their leaders insist this is a new style war fought for new style objectives, not for national glory. We began this campaign with reluctance but with resolve. We end it with no sense of rejoicing. We cannot rest until the refugees are home. But then, truly, we will be able to say that good has triumphed over evil, justice has overcome barbarism, and the values of civilization have prevailed. What is emerging from the Kosovo crisis is a major change in international affairs. The balance between the human rights of the individual and the power of the state has been altered. And the United Nations has given itself a new authority to intervene in the internal affairs of a sovereign country if it believes they're not being properly conducted. Brian Hanrahan, BBC News, Downing Street. The official... Nieci ha significato orrore e pulizia etnica. Smobilita l'esercito insieme alle forze di polizia e la loro partenza apre un interrogativo sulla possibilità di un nuovo esodo, quello dei serbi del Kosovo, che potrebbero essere spinti a lasciare la loro terra per paura di possibili vendette. Soldati che se ne vanno, altri, quelli della forza di pace, già schierati ai confini, pronti a entrare in Kosovo. Lo sbarco di 2200 marines americani che dovranno partecipare alla forza di pace è cominciato in un porto greco a sud di Salonicco. È di 18.500 uomini il contingente militare della Nato in Macedonia, pronto a entrare nella regione nelle prime ore di sabato. Soldati che dovranno costituire l'avanguardia di quella che è stata definita Operazione Guardiano Congiunto, la forza di pace che in tutto comprenderà 50.000 uomini, senza contare il contingente russo. L'importante è partecipare, sembrano dire i militari russi che manderanno nel Kosovo da 5 a 10 mila uomini anche se resta da risolvere la questione chiave del comando, quindi questione di responsabilità e soprattutto di prestigio. Si punta ad un accordo separato con la Nato ma a Mosca un risultato con gli emissari dell'Alleanza e con l'inviato americano Talbot non è stato ancora raggiunto. Colloqui rinviati a domani, un fatto è certo, ha anticipato Talbot, i russi non avranno un loro settore di responsabilità autonoma. Per quanto riguarda... La... Has promised not to pursue the retreating Serbs, but NATO fears that the impulse of revenge will be difficult to control. In this dangerous gap between victors and vanquished, more lives are at risk. Jim Fish, BBC News. You, that we saw refugees coming down will soon be filled with the vehicles behind you. That's right. It's a very narrow road, in fact, leading up to the border, which is about uh, half a mile away from here. You may just be able to see the Macedonian side of the border, the Macedonian Customs and Immigration Post. But it is a very narrow road, and uh, yes, within the coming 24 hours or so, uh, NATO troops will be streaming past here in their thousands, heading northwards into Kosovo without delay. Is NATO, Peter, still trying to get information about the possible hazards they might face? Yes, they are. And in fact, in the last hour, there has been another low-level liaison meeting uh, between NATO military officials and a Yugoslav military delegation, which came over the border uh, behind me in a convoy of vehicles. And they went into a small building, which is just here away to the left, a small Albanian cafe, which NATO has taken over. Uh, this was another meeting, a follow-up to one that took place yesterday. And what they've been discussing are the technical details of the Serb pullout and the way in which the K4 troops go in, and in particular the timings on the routes that are going to be used by the respective forces. NATO troops are obviously very keen to establish from the Serbs any information that might uh, uh, tell them about the possible hazards, the danger of landmines and so on. Are you hearing or seeing any evidence of, of skirmishing at the moment? Well, there have been a few explosions heard this morning uh, in the hills behind us here. Uh, those are the hills of Kosovo behind my right shoulder. There have been one or two explosions, um, no explanation as to what they were. There's also been the occasional sound of small arms fire. All I can say is that um, NATO d does want to know about any possible demining. It is possible that the Serbs have been uh, helping with that. Uh, we just don't know at the moment, but there certainly has been a little activity over the border there this morning. We were talking troops are heading for Kosovo. 
overland from Bosnia. That's uh, an, uh, an unaccredited, we haven't accredited a name yet from uh, NATO. Uh, they're going to get their feet on the ground first. That's what all this is about. And that's a source telling one wire agency. More on that, of course, in a moment. But the United States delegation has been holding talks in Moscow to try and resolve differences over Russia's participation in the peacekeeping force for Kosovo. Russia wants sole command of its troops working alongside, not under, a NATO-led command structure. The US has ruled that out, stressing the importance of one command arrangement for the whole of Kosovo. It's one of several differences that Russia is having with its Western counterparts. And all this after Russia's special envoy on Yugoslavia, Viktor Chernomerdin, played such a key part in brokering the peace plan for Kosovo. So as the international force starts to move towards Pristina, where does Russia stand? Our Moscow correspondent, Robert Parsons, has this report. As the dust of war settles in Kosovo, Russia remains convulsed by the storm of emotions whipped up by the Balkan crisis. The soul-searching is only just beginning. Is Russia still a great power? Did the Kremlin betray the Serbs? And what now should be Russia's relationship with the West, and in particular NATO? In part, the answer lies out on the bleak plains of northern Russia. These paratroopers are training for participation in the International Peacekeeping Force for Kosovo. They'll serve alongside NATO troops, they say, but in no circumstances under NATO command. As a statement of intent, the message is clear. Russia wants to work with the West, but on its own terms. The Kremlin needs to take into account a public incensed by NATO's bombing of Yugoslavia. Russian support for the Serbs, Slavs and Orthodox Christians like themselves is fueled by a burning sense of humiliation. This is a country that still thinks of itself as a great power, but feels spurned by the West. It still officially claims uh, something which Russia cannot get. Russia still officially claims to be a power whose uh, consent is indispensable for any major international event or any international action, which is, which is not true. For a man as proud as Boris Yeltsin, such a change in circumstances has been hard to accept. But while in public he's continued to lambast NATO, behind the scenes he's conceded ground. Former Prime Minister Viktor Chernomyrdin has become the moderate face of the Kremlin.